Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about untangling the block DAG. Um, this works. So this talk is going to be, uh, even though the, the workshop is on applications, economics, law, and ethics, I'm going to focus on blockchains. And if you squint, it might, there might be some things that look a little bit like economics, but uh, for the economists among you, it probably won't look too much like economics. OK, so uh, DAG, what is a DAG? Um, and Um, and why do we want one? Oh, sorry, I'm not making a slide. Um, this is the things I'm going to be talking about in the, <laughs> in the talk. So first, I'm, I'm going to explain what a block DAG is and why we would want a block DAG. And I'll talk a little bit about the challenges, why it's uh, harder, in some sense, to, uh, to create a dog, uh, block DAG protocol compared to a blockchain protocol. And then I'll have a brief and very incomplete survey of uh, block DAG protocols, and a little bit deeper dive into the space mesh uh, consensus protocol, which is a specific example of a, of a block DAG protocol. So let's start with the ledger. This is basically what all the, the blockchain protocols are trying to build, is a, is a ledger. And what do we actually need when we create a ledger? What are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to create a consensus on an ordered list. So think of this as a list of transactions. And of course, we care about the order in which tran transactions happen. And consensus in the sense that everybody should agree on what's in the list and what the order is. And uh, this is critical, right, if you have this, uh, this ledger, and you can think of this as, as time going by, and the ledger records where the money is, right? So the money moves, and it's very important that everybody agree where the money is, otherwise, uh, we can't actually run uh, a cryptocurrency office. But that's not enough, right? So this consensus property is something that, uh, say, you know, Byzantine agreement protocols have been doing for a long time. But it's not enough for us to get a consensus. We also want this to be irreversible. And what I mean by that is history doesn't change, right? So it, we could theoretically have a consensus protocol where everybody agrees uh, at all times on what the state is, but today we agree that Alice has the money, and then tomorrow we suddenly agree that Bob had the money all along. So that is not a good uh, situation if we want to run a cryptocurrency. And we'd also like things uh, like robustness in terms of uh, changing old history. So all of these things are, of course, under various assumptions, and we always have to think about, you know, what if our assumptions are wrong or maybe just slightly wrong, um, how easy is it to, to break the properties that we want to achieve? And it would be nice if sort of the older things are, the more set in stone they are. Because right? if we, somebody can change something that happened 10 years ago, then everything since then is chaos. Right? But if I can only change something that happened in the last hour, then maybe I can recover from that. So we'd like things to be sort of more robust the older they are. There are also some other properties we want, like uh, chain quality. Um, this is sort of the, uh, in, in the distributed computation thing, it's called liveness, uh, but it's a, it's a more um, quantitative version. So it's not enough that we add honest things, honest transactions. We want the honest transactions to be sort of added in the, about uh, the same fraction as they're actually submitted. Again, I, I'm also, uh, you know, hand-waving a lot of things here. This whole talk is going to be no, not very technical without any proofs. What, uh, what's sorry? the definition of an honest entry? Yeah, so those are one of the things that I'm, I'm hand waving. What exactly does it mean that there's an honest transaction? Here I'm also. Can you give any intuition for what an honest transaction is? Like, it, does it so, mean? So here, okay, so, so actually, when what we measure here is not the transactions, but the <coughs> blocks. Um, and. He, for this talk, you can think of each block as sort of a container for a transaction. Uh, we don't really care if it's one transaction or several transactions. Um, and usually, you get a reward for generating a block. But, uh, and, and so we want the honest parties to get sort of their fair share of the rewards. But I, I don't want to go very deeply into this, because it will sort of sidetrack us. 
Okay, finally, something that uh, we may want, and I think this is sort of the main new thing that blockchain protocols give us, is this whole thing in a permissionless setting, where basically anyone can join the system and leave the system at any time, and I don't need to ask for permission from anyone. I just you know, run my own computer and I can join the system. Okay, so that's what we want. Now, why is that hard to get? Well, first of all, it's uh, the adversary, right? If, if nobody's attacking us, it would be easy. But the problem here is that uh, the adversary that's attacking us is very powerful. Um, so, for example, it's not enough to think that you know, people who are attacking us are going to be rational. They'll only do whatever it is that gains them the most money. At least, maybe some of them are, but you know, there, if, a, if a protocol is permissionless, enough people can join it, there will always be some people who want to just you know, hack it for fun and they don't care about making money. Or on the other hand, if we're talking about an, uh, an ecosystem with many of these uh, ledgers, then it might actually even be rational to do an irrational thing locally in some systems. So I might lose all my money in one system because I crashed that whole cryptocurrency and now I get money in some other way because maybe I shorted it. So we have to consider a malicious adversary. We also have to consider an ongoing attack. So the adversary is always attacking. We have this, these systems are running all the time. They're on the internet. And everybody's uh, constantly attacked. And you, know, you connect a computer to the internet, it starts getting attacked within about 30 seconds. Uh, and th the same is a, is a reasonable assumption for cryptocurrency systems. And finally, I think this is what is the, the hardest part is what we can assume about the network. So in most of these protocols, we want to assume that the adversary has full control over the network timing. Why, even though the adversary might not actually have full control over network timing, um, the network timing over is, is sort of bad enough that you know, to be on the safe side, this is something that we should uh, assume. Now, when I say full control, I don't mean completely full control. There, otherwise, we just couldn't do anything. So the, the usual assumption is that the adversary can delay messages, can reorder messages, but it can't stop them forever. So there's some bound, say we call it delta, where, uh, say, 30 seconds, the adversary can hold a message for 30 seconds, but after that, everybody will see it. So, these are the, the sort of the challenging environment in which we have to work to design the protocol. And we know that consensus is hard, like even if we have um, fixed parties, we all know who the parties are and we all agree on who the parties are and the network is synchronous, right? So th this is a classic problem that's been studied for many, many years. And the problem is we don't know who to trust, right? So we, have, we know who the parties are, but we don't know which parties are malicious and which are not. And and this makes it really, really hard. In fact, it makes it so hard that permissionless consensus is provably impossible. Unless we, we do something else. And why is it impossible? Because the adversary can create these civil identities. The adversary can always sort of duplicate itself as many times as it wants. And now uh, it can have a 90% majority of all the identities. And I mean, uh, assuming that you're doing the consensus based on, on, on like yes. number of identities. Right. Obviously, this morning I presented a permissionless consensus that was possible. Oh, obviously, permissionless consensus is possible because we'll, we'll get to permissionless consensus. I'm saying this is like the, the classic, in the classic model, permissionless consensus is impossible. Right? We have to add some kind of new assumption in order to get permissionless consensus. Um, so so we, we need an honest majority, but we can't get that if this is our, our basic model. For majority-based consensus. Well, for, for consensus that satisfies the standard uh, properties that... That's not... I think no. Raphael Bass has a paper showing, you know, uh, from, from a bit more Whatever basic assumptions. The no, there are much older papers, not a, not right? Not like system, right? So you, you end up doing majority-based stuff. To, to Whatever you wrote on last slide is not correct, but there's some... Th this is like a, a classic result from the 70s, right? The, Byzantine agreement requires an honest majority. But those were all based on like uh, assuming sort of like symmetric configurations. Like you're talking about like old lamp Okay, uh, as I said, 
in, in this is the standard model. If you're changing the model, you can do other things. Yes, and, and we're going to change the model. So you're right. There, there are different ways to, to sort of define what you want, and then you'll get different things. Yeah, I mean, your but work changes the model <coughs> in the sense that each person selects, you know, the other, this quorum. Right, but you didn't say anything about the model in your bullet. So right, right. right. So. Yes, so, so, okay, here, uh, this is, I, I didn't explicitly say it, but we're talking about the standard model, it's impossible. This is just a, a bullet point yeah, to say we need to do something different. Specifically symmetric, right? Every honest party is symmetric with every other honest party, meaning trust exactly the same group, right? So Yeah, but you also have like Machian writer, Byzantine forums, you have, there, there, uh, there was, like, there's been like multiple papers on this, like, you know, 10 or more years old. Um, that, like, that involve other things. I mean, at the end, what you need is like form intersection, basically, or you know, so for, for a lot of these, for, for, for most of these. But to say that you can't get consensus with, with a, without a majority is like ignoring, like, uh, you know, established. The results. slide is imprecise. It yes. didn't put all the statements yes. under which the impossibility is true. We yes. all agree. That. Yes, okay. that's totally correct. Yeah. yeah, and I'm going to show like another model in which it is possible to get permissions. So, and th this is the Satoshi Nakamoto's, I think, the, like, the nice uh, observation that he made, or she or they, um, is that we don't have to look at parties, we can look at resources instead. So if we choose resources that are easy to measure um, and hard to fake, then we can do basically switch this honest majority assumption to an honest majority of resources, and now we can suddenly do things again. Not true either because you're moving the goalposts, right? In the old group, I'm changing the model. Yeah. In classic definition, you could you needed three things, right? You needed agreement, uh, you, you know, uh, termination, and validity, right? And now you said you don't need agreement anymore. You can change your vote. No, right? we do need agreement. No, because we have blockchain reorgs, right? There's no, you don't have finality in like say a, a Nakamoto consensus, right? It's Specifically, in a Nakamoto consensus, we might not have finality, but we can build a consensus under these uh, assumptions that does have finality. Okay. But probabilistic, yeah. uh, right? Not reaching consensus probabilistically, you, you also have in, or you have in possibilities in the classical model as well. You need prob probability and not, not, not finality right, in classical settings as well. No, but uh, asynchronous, uh, asynchronous yeah. settings, right? That, that doesn't come from the Nakamoto thing. Right, in FLP, you're right, you're, or like right. in like partial synchrony, you sacrifice right. on liveness. That's, that's not because that's sacrificing on safety, so it's a different, it's a different thing. So okay. it depends exactly how you define it, right? But that's not because of the proof of work. Yes, it is. Uh, so I, so I, I, I just yeah, yeah, let, let, let's uh, take it offline. I, I agree that there are various differences in the definitions, and we're, we're sliding things under the rug here. Um, okay, so how does... Nakamoto's solution look. This is probably something uh, you all know, right? We are going to elect a random leader by lottery where the probability of winning depends on the relative resource. And now the leader is going to determine the next block. What is a block? Again, think of it here as a transaction that also has a little bit of additional information. In particular, it has a pointer. Um, and each block, when it, the, the leader generates the block, it also decides what is the correct history so far, and it puts that in the block. And because most of the time the lottery is built that we have only a single leader elected, then we get consensus, right? Because the single leader is for a long enough period, for, for more than delta time, uh, the only one available, then everybody can see that this is the only one. And so everybody agrees, and nobody else can try to present a new leader because they didn't win the lottery in that time period. So we get consensus, and that's wonderful. Um, but you know, it's probabilistic. Sometimes we do have multiple leaders that are elected uh, at the same time or at nearly the same time. And then we have a kind of race, right? Who gets to win? And the rule for Nakamoto consensus is basically we wait until the next time when there's a single leader, and they'll get to choose. And in general, what we do is we look at the longest chain. So we take the, the chain that has uh, sort of the most resources attached to it, and that is the correct chain, and all other blocks are just considered invalid. Okay, so that was the Nakamoto blockchain in a nutshell. And 
now we can think a bit about generally what is the, the ledger topology, right? So now we can think of a ledger that's built in this way that has like this kind this flavor, right? Then it's composed of blocks that have a transaction and a pointer. Um, now what do we mean by a pointer? A pointer is a hash of the contents of another block. And because of the way we use these collision resistant hash functions, we can think of this effectively as just a unique name for a block. There's no, like we, we cannot find a different name for, for the same block, so there's only one for each block. And in fact, it's a, because the blocks contain the pointers themselves, then a, a name for a block is also a name for the entire history that this block points to. So when I point to a block, I'm actually saying this, this block and what it points to, those are the entire history. And the nice thing about this, because I cannot find the, the, a different name for a block and I can't figure out what the name is before I have the block, if I can point to a block, then inherently it means that I've generated my block after the block I'm pointing to, to was generated. Because I simply cannot find uh, the name of a block, or maybe I should say it a different way, if I have this name, I, can, I can't go backwards and find a block. So the only way I can generate a valid name is take a block that I know and hash it. So the topology here implies an ordering relation, in term, a temporal ordering relation. I knew this block and only then I could generate the block that points to it. Okay, so now we're talking about a specific topology, the chain topology, where each block has a single pointer and it points to some other block. Um, oops. And this has some nice advantages. So one, it's very simple. Everybody understands what a chain is. And two, there's a unique way to order the, the blocks in a chain that are consistent with this topological ordering. So basically, the topology completely determines the order of transactions. So all I need to do is say, this is the correct block. This is the endpoint. And now I know everything about history. I don't need anything else, which is really nice and, and simple. There are also some things that might not be inherent to the chain topology, but they're very nice properties of this uh, Nakamoto consensus protocol, which are that it also has these irreversibility and robustness properties. So because when I add a block, I'm basically each block here, you can think of it as contributing a resource or binding a resource to this pointer, then uh, the more blocks I have, sort of the more resources support whatever they're pointing to. And so the longer the chain, sort of the more confident I can be that things that are you know, further back in the chain uh, will not change. And this can be formalized in this uh, sort of probabilistic way, which said that the adversary, just the, the, the probability that it can ever create a longer chain basically depends only on this, uh, this length of the chain. And, and what fraction of the resources the adversary has. So this is very nice and simple, and this is probably uh, one of the reasons why almost all of the blockchain protocols are built in this way. Well, yeah. On that last point, like, what is it about the Nakamoto blockchain that provides that property? It seems like any blockchain would have the property that if you, you know, if you accept a later block, you're inherently accepting all earlier blocks. So it seems like confidence can be so, so that's true, but it's not always true that the resources are bound in the same way to the pointers. Um, so, so they don't work in exactly the same way. And you can think of, of like different things that you, know, you do with blocks that uh, you, know, you run a separate BFT protocol and create blocks, and it's not a, like a one-to-one, -one, this resource uh, binds to the block. Or even things like proof of stake, where you could create different blocks using the same resource, and then things become murkier. It's not decreasing, but it's not increasing, right? It's like, sure. Yes. Like it's not it, it might not cause the, the, the confidence to grow, and definitely it might not cause it to grow exponentially, say, with the length, right? So it's not clear that <coughs> this is an inherent property of a chain. OK, so that, that's the good things about chains. By the way, how much time do I have? You've done 14 minutes, so uh, 26. Um, so why not just use chains for everything? Well, specifically, this Nakamoto consensus uh, has inherent scalability problems. 
And the thing is that here we're really strongly assuming that there is, at, some, at many points in time, only a single block. But what happens if we have many blocks almost all the time? So in this case, what we get is a chain that forks and forks and forks. And now the, the honest parties, when they try to decide what's the longest chain, they don't agree. So the honest parties are basically splitting their work between many, many chains. And the adversary can then choose which of the chains to put its own little bit of work on. And it can basically say, this chain is going to be the longest. Or it can make sure that the chains all stay about equal so the forking will continue forever. And so we won't actually get consensus. So basically, if forks are common, then we don't have security. And the, the flip side of that is if we want security, then we need to make forks uncommon. And for that, we need to have the interval between blocks, between these lottery wins, be long enough that with high probability, we'll get these single blocks. But this interval is a limit, right? If, if a limit on, on, the, on the throughput of the network. Right? If we try to increase the throughput of the network, we have to either put more blocks per time period or make them bigger. But if we make them bigger, it actually also uh, has a, the, the, pr the effect of increasing the network latency, this delta that uh, we are saying how long that the messages are delayed. So we can't do that because, again, we'll get forking. So this protocol has inherent limits. There are also some problems with the incentive, the, the mechanism design here. Um, so I think uh, Itai showed that there are these uh, selfish mining uh, problems where actually if you look at what the rational miner would do, then in some cases it's actually better to not publish blocks and let everyone continue and run the honest protocol. It's better to keep it to yourself. And that way you can get a head start on the next block and make all the other parties sort of waste their work because they're working on something that won't get chosen. Um, and it turns out if you analyze this, it actually is, is a, you know, the rational thing to do. And if all the honest parties become are, are rational instead of honest, if they actually do this, then again, security will break down. Because if everybody withholds blocks, then we don't get the, the nice properties that we want. Um, and finally, we have this sort of more general wasted resources. Right? If we only store this longest chain, then we're losing the, the information that we have in, in this whole, uh, um, the, the whole set of data that we received. So for instance, in this graph, right, there are many more uh, blocks pointing to this than pointing to this. So it seems really to assume that more honest parties thought that this block was the correct one than this block. But if all we store is the longest path, then you know, this path and this path are sort of equally good. And so we've lost this information. OK, so this is sort of the, the motivation. We can solve these problems in different ways. And one of the ways we can solve them is DAGs. So the idea of a block DAG is let's allow a more general topology. Instead of just having this single chain, we'll allow graphs that are not necessarily chains. And then we might have to replace this longest chain rule with something else. And of course, now we have a lot more leeway. And so there are actually many very different ways to, um, to build these DAGs, the different kinds of graphs, and also different uh, rules for how we, we go from a graph to an actual ordering of transactions. And these precise choices actually make a huge difference in exactly what properties we get from, this pro from these protocols. So the advantages are almost always high throughput, because now we can uh, publish many blocks at the same time. And then depending on how we exactly build these things, uh, we could get lower latency or not. We could get you know, a better incentive structure that does not have these problems. Uh, we could even sort of remove the need for lotteries where uh, you have you know, somebody chosen at random and instead have you know, people being chosen deterministically every fixed time period. So there's been a lot of work on DAGs. This is a very partial list. Um, it includes the things that uh, I know have papers with something that resembles a proof. Um, 
there are lots of other things that are sort of heuristic arguments. Some of them might be okay, I'm not sure, but I think one of the sort of critical things in, in any kind of uh, protocol that you rely on its security is uh, to give a proof of security because just running these protocols won't convince us that they're secure. Um, so I'm going to sort of very briefly go over these protocols um, and apologies to the people in this room who know much more than me about them and whenever I make mistakes, please point them out. So I'm, I'm going to like give sort of my uh, view of sort of what is the intuition, like the, the basic idea behind uh, these things and, and then a little bit more about space mesh. So let's start with uh, Ghost. This was uh, one of the first ones. So there the structure is uh, just like a slight generalization. Instead of a chain, we're going to have a tree. So we still have one pointer from each block, but now we keep the whole thing. We don't just keep the longest chain. And the main improvement here is that we're going to include uncles. So we don't just uh, re re store the, the longest chain. We're also going to uh, remember that, say, this block has more support than this block because this one has one, two, three, four blocks pointing to it in aggregate, whereas this one has only three. And so even though the longest chain rule would say, you know, we should choose this, here we're going to choose this one because um, it has overall more support. So that's the basic idea. It solves this wasted work problem and uh, so hopefully makes things a bit harder to attack. It has, I think, some problems uh, with the chain quality and like there, there are various uh, um, trade-offs here. But this, this thing has actually been used in practice. I think Ethereum is still using a version of it or not anymore? Never what? They never, they never did? They just claimed to use a version of this? Yeah. Okay. They said they would, and then but they didn't, I see. As a standard protocol, they did something okay. completely different. So it's almost being used in practice. <laughs> Um, okay, then there are two things that are actually quite different, but I'm you know, globbing them together uh, because they have, in some sense, a similar flavor. This is inclusive blockchains and fruit chains. So these are sort of, the, the structure is now a DAG, so you can have um, actually more than one pointer, but um, it's sort of a weak DAG because actually we really still care only about the longest chain, so it's specifically in inclusive blockchains. Um, what we're going to, to do is still choose uh, the heaviest chain for saying what is the correct history. But now uh, we can also include other transactions. So if we have transactions here that don't conflict with those on the main chain, then we can also add them. Um, and I'm going to ignore, there, there are lots of, uh, especially in, in fruit chain, I think there are all these uh, mechanisms for how to design the incentives correctly. So how you, you make sure that people are incentivized, miners are incentivized to create the blocks and to uh, create the transactions correctly and things like that. And so they solve um, and many of these uh, selfish mining problems. Yes? So just a question. I know you're sort of summarizing a bunch of mechanisms in general, but now there's a bunch of arrows. There are blocks that point to multiple previous yes. blocks. So some of the mechanisms have that feature as well where you don't uniquely track back that you can, like your... Yeah, so, so in general, we can always say, just you know, point to everything you see, yeah. right? And then after the fact, we can say, what would you have done if you had been, say, using the longest chain rule, right? And so, so th like, it never hurts us to include these things. It just like, might make us store more stuff. Um, but here, we're actually using it for a little bit more than that. So we can use similarly to the ghost protocol, use it for getting sort of more confirmations for older blocks. And also now in addition to what ghost does, which is just sort of use the weight of the work to say what is the correct history, here we're also uh, increasing throughput by taking sort of transactions that didn't make it into the main chain. Um, okay, so that is the inclusive blockchains and fruit chain. How do they solve selfish mining? Is there an intuition for that? Well, uh, th this is something I completely ignored. So uh, they actually have an analysis. Uh, the, the incentive mechanism here is, is different, right? You get incentivized not just for generating a block, but also for generating an uncle. And like if you have a, a transaction that was included in your block,
but wasn't on the main chain or in fruit chains, the, the whole way of, of transactions is a bit different. So, so there's a completely different incentive mechanism. Um, OK, then there's the OHI, which is a completely different type of uh, DAG. So there, the, the structure is actually parallel chain. So they're composing sort of the regular Nakamoto chains. And they have a fixed number of them, say k chains. And how do they get a full order? Um, what they do is they say, let's take some uh, number of, of transactions at the end of the chain, which we know we're not convinced of their validity yet, because they haven't had enough confirmations. So we'll say these are sort of partially confirmed. And now we'll take sort of the, the minimum where transactions are fully confirmed. They have enough co confirmations on all the chains. And then we'll just order transactions uh, in order uh, of, the, of the chain, and, uh, of the, yeah, which chain, and then within each chain. Um, by the order of the each chain. And, and they show a security reduction to Nakamoto consensus, basically. They're saying if Nakamoto consensus is secure, this should also be secure. And this mainly solves the throughput problem. So it, because it's uh, basically Nakamoto consensus, but in parallel, then you get most of the problems of Nakamoto consensus, uh, except that you now have many blocks in parallel, so you can get more throughput. So, so do they set the hardness parameter in the same way that Nakamoto? So, so, so the hardness is divided, so basically, they're setting it so if in Nakamoto you'd have one block in 10 minutes, here you get uh, one block in each chain every 10 minutes, something like that. So the hardness on each chain is, is less. less. Yes. So I don't see why you could reduce it to Nakamoto. I mean, why couldn't there be a fork on the second chain? There can be forks, but they're, they're solved in the same way. So in each one, we, we take the longest chain. Yeah, I guess I don't understand how parallel composition works in in this in, in the consensus model because uh, you know as you said if uh, if you just set the hardness of each of the chains to be one third smaller then an attacker could still just attack one of the chains. Okay, no. So so the way you you don't decide which chain you're going to be mining on, but uh, when you mine, sort of the output like when you win the puzzle, it tells you which chain you're going to be creating your block on. <coughs> So, so you can't just say, I'm going to mine on this chain with uh, more power. You have to mine sort of simultaneously on all of them, and then you get randomly selected to be on one of them. OK. This is the That's the trick in the security proof, that you could reduce the hardness of? Yes. Uh, well, I, I actually am not completely sure what the trick in the security proof is, because I didn't uh, go deep into the details of their proof. But, but this is the, the, in the construction, that's the trick. OK, I mean, if parallel, so just to say if this was correct, mm -hmm. then parallel composition would basically get you everything you wanted, right? Like, you would get, uh, you would be able to reduce the latency because the hardness parameter is lower, and uh, you can. No, I don't think you can reduce the latency here because you, you have to wait for confirmation until all the chains have been confirmed. Oh, I see. So, okay. yeah. So, so it doesn't actually help with latency. It helps basically only with throughput, I think. And the advantage here is that it's very simple. Like, you, you don't have a complex DAG structure. Are there any other questions about this? Um, then there's uh, Spectre. Again, uh, going back to one of the NCS partners. So Spectre has a full DAG um, where you know, any block can point to sort of everything it sees. And here, the idea is, once we have this DAG, we now need to decide on the order of transactions or the order of blocks. And the way we do it is we sort of consider each block as uh, voting about the pairwise order of all the previous blocks in the graph. So how do we uh, vote about a pairwise order? So let's think of, say, this block and see how it votes about previous blocks. So if we're comparing two blocks that have uh, a chain between them, uh, a path between them, then the order is very clear, right? So L sees that J has a path to B, so it must be that B is less than J, right? Because of this uh, topological property, 
J must have been created after B. Okay, what about uh, J and F? So now there's no path between them. <coughs> um, but in this case, actually, there's no path at all between L and F. Right? So L hasn't seen F. Because if it had seen F, it would have pointed to F in the DAG. So if it hasn't seen a block and it did see a different block, then that block comes first. Because right? it saw this and it hasn't seen the other one yet. So it, it votes that J is less than F. And then you get the more complex <coughs> situations where it has seen two blocks, but there's no path between them. And in this case, it uses the recursive computation and basically says, what do the, blo the other blocks I see think about them? So here we have uh, one block that thinks that this block came before this block. Right? So there's one vote that this comes before this and no votes in uh, the other direction. So, it, so L votes that I comes before J. So this is the basic idea. Am I uh, getting this wrong? There's more coding going on. This Th there's, yeah, there's more stuff. I wish it but was that okay. It's a little bit more. Uh, this is a simplification of the actual idea. Um, yeah. And OK, so from this, we can basically get uh, pairwise ordering. And uh, using the more things going on, we can prove that we will actually converge to, so honest parties will agree on the pairwise ordering. But the problem is they won't agree on the pairwise ordering of all blocks. But they will only, they're only guaranteed to agree on the pairwise ordering of honestly generated blocks. So the adversary might be able to generate blocks that sort of stall, where the honest parties are not guaranteed to ever converge to uh, a common agreement about you know, which one comes first. And the, the idea, Inspector, is that if we think of um, simple payment transactions, then this situation is actually good enough. Basically, um, I, I don't care about stalling sort of malicious payments. Honest payments will always get resolved quickly. And you know, fine, the adversary uh, can wait. If, if it's attacking things, it can slow itself down. This isn't good enough for smart contracts because there we actually really care about the entire state and there we, we need a full ordering. So, so Spectre uh, could work for, um, for simple payment systems but not for more complex smart contract systems. Okay, so then they, their next paper uh, the <laughs> tries to fix this. Um, this is the phantom system. Again, it's a, a full DAG. And here they're going to get a full ordering on blocks. <coughs> but now instead of doing this pairwise voting, they're going to do a slightly more complex thing, which is search the graph for a subgraph that's sort of very well connected. And the intuition is that if we think of what the honest uh, parties generate, the subgraph of only the honestly generated blocks, then this should have the property that it's very well connected because honest parties see each other all the time. So if we find such a graph, and this isn't like immediately obvious, but this is something we prove, then you know, it will, uh, we'll, we'll be able to sort of agree that this is the, the right uh, graph. And then what they do, oops, should have, oh, okay, you can barely see it. So there's, this here is the, the well connected subgraph. And then the idea for the full ordering is, um, we'll take all the blocks in this well-connected subgraph first and put all the blocks outside of this graph after them. And if we all agree on exactly which blocks are in the well-connected subgraph, then it's also easy to agree on an ordering because then we can just say order them uh, by topological ordering and then you know, by ID or something. Um, and because the adversary uh, cannot generate sort of late blocks that go into this, it can't change history. Right? If, if the adversary tries to generate a block you know, after the fact and claim somehow that it was earlier, then it won't be in this well-connected graph because the honest parties won't point to it. And so uh, it will always appear after the, the honest blocks in the final ordering. Um, okay, so in the final few minutes, 
I'll talk about the space mesh consensus, which is uh, called the tortoise and hare consensus, which is another uh, kind of DAG. Um, <coughs> so one of the, the properties that uh, we worked uh, quite hard to get here is this robustness to failures, um, something that actually Nakamoto consensus has sort of uh, very easily. Um, why do we need uh, to plan for failures? And what do I mean by failures here? I mean failures in our basic assumptions. Right, so all, all of the protocols that I've showed, uh, assuming their proofs are correct, are guaranteed to get you know, all these good properties if there's an honest majority or a two-thirds honest majority or whatever they need and the network it has the you know, appropriate connectivity. You know, they, they, there's a list of assumptions and you know, this is how proofs work. Right? We have assumptions, if they're all satisfied, we get the, the guarantees. But um, Assumptions in the real world aren't always satisfied, and especially if we're talking about things that should be running for a very long time. So even if you have things that are, you know, one in you know one million or two to the minus forty or whatever statistical security parameter you like, these are the sort of the, the things that people usually choose. Then over uh, forty years or a hundred years, these things will happen, and. It's important for these systems to be able to recover automatically from these assumption failures. The reason is that the whole point we're, we're, uh, of using a decentralized permissionless system is that we don't trust any central authority. And if in order to recover from a failure, we have to trust a central authority, like somebody has to say, oh, we'll manually switch the code to do something, then we have a problem. Um, so, I mean, it's not that these things are insurmountable as we saw uh, you know, in the DAO attack, like, sometimes we can recover manually, but it's much, much better if the system can recover automatically. So uh, what we want is for these systems to have what we call a self-healing mode, where at least, so, okay, what can we when, hope to get after we have this kind of assumption failure? We can't hope that, you know, nothing goes wrong and everything will be exactly as it was before because uh, otherwise, we could just prove our system is secure without these assumptions. But at the very least, we could hope that we were all going to agree on the state of the system um, after the, the you know, good conditions are restored. And uh, ideally, we also have this robustness. Uh, when I said that older history should be more secure, so we want it to continue also in, in this type of setting. So sort of the, the assumption failures need to be worse to uh, change history that's older. Um, so specifically in space mesh, the cell, we, we do have these properties, but the self-healing mode um, actually uses slightly stricter assumptions. So we don't need complete quiet, but we need like the attack to go down to lower levels than you know, the, the, uh, what we can tolerate when we're not in self-healing. Okay, the second thing that we tried to, to achieve with, uh, with Space Mesh was to have a race-free protocol. Basically, uh, what we mean is there are no races, and honest behavior is always rewarded. So this is not sort of a necessary condition uh, for things to be incentive compatible, but if you have this condition, it's much, much easier to formally prove that it actually the honest thing is the correct thing to do. Um, in particular, right, the adversary won't be able to get any advantage by withholding blocks or you know, interfering in, in some other way with the honest parties because if it could get some advantage, then honest behavior wouldn't always be rewarded. So again, our formal guarantees for this property are under stricter assumptions. So say we get one-third malicious, uh, uh, we need a two-thirds honest majority for the sort of standard guarantees, and for this, we need, I don't remember, but slightly more. Um, the other thing that we can get, um, and this is something that we required because uh, our uh, cryptocurrency is not built on proofs of work, it's built on proofs of space-time, is that we don't require Poisson lottery. So I think all of the proofs of security of the things uh, I've shown uh, sort of have this property that blocks are generated uh, randomly with a Poisson distribution, so they appear with equal probability in any interval of time. And they use this very strongly to, to get these properties that uh, we will converge finally to agreement. Um, 
And in space mesh, we don't actually need that. So we can actually do it, um, I won't say deterministically, because we do need randomness, but uh, we don't need these, these lotteries. So we, we can have parties generate blocks you know, every five minutes um, exactly on the hour. Okay, so how does it work? So here our structure is uh, what we call a mesh, a layered DAG. So ideally what you'd have is uh, blocks in layers. So every five minutes you have a layer. Um, and again, th this is not on average every five minutes, but like clock time. So at 12 o'clock you have a layer, 12.05, 12.10, and so forth. And every block uh, points to all the blocks it sees in the preceding layers. Um, so actually formally that it does point to things that were <coughs> in earlier layers if, uh, if they haven't been uh, included already, but this is sort of the, the ideal structure when there's no attack. Um, and in each layer, all the blocks are published at the same time. So layer one is published at the same time, layer two is published at the same time, and so forth. And now when we want to, to have uh, full ordering on blocks, we order them first by layer and then within each layer by ID. Again, this is a simplification. In practice, we might do some randomization within each layer, but this is the, the basic idea, yeah. So, so uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand the proof of work or, or, or space time. So yeah. if I have multiple identities, how does that reflect in, in my blocks? Do so, so the way you can think of this is there's a completely separate proof that I used up my resource. Okay, I publish it separately. And each of these resource proofs entitles me to one block. At some, some, At some future time. And, and that future time will show you know, this block is because of that resource. And when I uh, publish this proof, I might even know ahead of time exactly when my block is going to be published. Uh, more resources, I can build more blocks in the same layer? Yeah, so the more, the more resources I have, the more blocks I get. How many blocks are per layer? So, so we basically, again, it's not a Poisson lottery, but we shuffle the blocks so that you have, on average, the same number of blocks in each layer. So, so you have an expect expected number of blocks? Yes, we have an expected number of blocks per layer, and this is how we limit the, the you have some communication. It's yes, it's, it, it's not. Uh, and also, you know, even if you're entitled to a block, you might not put your block there, so we can't no, guarantee. It's not a limit, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, uh, other models of, of, of proof of work uh, where you have like very short time periods, you, you flip a coin every time period. At the limit, you, you become a Poisson distribution. Uh, not exactly, but I mean, there is some randomness there, and, but it's used in slightly different ways, so. <clears throat> okay, so now, um, even though it's, I guess, morally equivalent, in, in say, Spectre and Phantom, what we were trying to do is you know, sort of all the blocks are valid in some sense, and we're just trying to decide on in the ordering. Here, we have a fixed ordering, and we're trying to decide which blocks are valid. So an adversary can always claim a block is in layer two, even if it now is layer four. And of course, we wouldn't want that to happen, because then it would insert a block into ancient history. So we want blocks that you know, are created late, to be considered invalid by all the honest parties, and we want all the honest blocks to be considered valid by all the honest parties. <clears throat> so how do we do it? So we also use a kind of voting mechanism, except that here we're not using this pairwise ordering voting. What we're doing is we're voting on the validity. So each block uh, basically votes on the validity of all the previous blocks that it sees. So for every block, so say if we look at this block, Right, it thinks this block is valid and these blocks are valid. This block, it thinks it's invalid because it received it after the deadline for receiving blocks from layer two. So we, we look at this uh, vote and then how do we vote about blocks that we haven't personally seen? We count all the votes that we, from the blocks that we have seen and then we take the majority. So we're assuming that the majority of blocks are generated, honestly, because th this follows from an assumption that the majority of the resources are controlled by honest parties, and uh, each resource sort of entitles you to one block. So this is the equivalent assumption in blocks. And now it's fairly easy to see that if all the honest blocks 
voted the same way about some block. So suppose they all think that block is honest, is valid. Then from now on, every honest block will always think that block is honest. Because there's always a majority vote for that block, and it just gets better with time. And this argument basically um, is almost exactly the same as the argument for why uh, the Nakamoto consensus gets more confident over time. Except that here we get something you know, slightly better because we have, say, 200 blocks in each <coughs> layer. So you get confidence faster. Right? You have a 200 block majority, and then it's you know, immediate. Yeah. So do you have any assumptions on, on um, the clocks being somewhat synchronized? So you, you say something like, yes. Yeah, so is invalid if it doesn't Yes, yeah, so, so we assume that clocks, so, so we sort of uh, hide this in the network delay. So you can assume that the, the clock shift is part of the network delay, but the, the delay plus the clock shift is under, say, 30 seconds. Which is reasonable because you can synchronize clocks yes. based on yes. network delay. Yeah. Do you know how this compares to PRISM? I don't know how to compare it to PRISM. No, we don't know PRISM in detail enough to OK. Um, so this is great if all the, um, well, sorry, this, this we call the tortoise protocol. I'll, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but this, this is great when all the honest parties agree on some block. But uh, it actually doesn't work for blocks that are adversarially generated. Because for adversarially generated blocks, it could be that the adversary delayed them for some honest parties and did not delay them for other parties. And so some honest parties think they're, on it, they're, they're valid and some think they're invalid. And now the vote can split half-half. Now with very little power, the adversary can always sort of generate additional votes that will always maintain this half-half uh, voting split. And this is what we call a balancing attack. So this is something that if we just used this voting mechanism could go on forever. It's the same problem that Spectre had, basically. Right? You would never reach consensus. So how do we solve this? we add some randomness. So this is sort of a trick from standard um, Byzantine agreement protocols. right? If we, we can't do this uh, deterministically. We're going to add some random component. And the, the basic idea is that we're going to look at the vote margin. So if the vote margin is you know, this block is valid by a huge majority, then it's going to be, we'll, we'll vote that it's valid. If it's invalid by a huge majority, we'll vote that it's invalid. But if it's in the middle, we're going to flip a coin. Of course, if we all flipped separate coins, then this wouldn't help. And what we do is we flip a, what we call a weak common coin. It's a coin that has a property that, at least with some probability, uh, say, I don't know, one-tenth, one-third, you know, uh, the, the more the better, all the honest parties will agree what the value of this coin is. And when that happens, and the value of the coin sort of is, the, is the right value that the adversary didn't guess correctly, then we will get consensus. And so basically, in each layer, all the blocks are going to vote according to this coin if there's a balancing attack. Until we get a good coin flip, and then everything works out. And from then on, uh, we just get better and better confidence using the previous argument. So th this is the, the sort of, in a nutshell, how the consensus algorithm works. What I did not tell you is how we get this to be efficient, because uh, the protocol I described now is horribly inefficient in communication and computational complexity. So it, it's not um, NP-hard, like the phantom protocol, but um, it is like N-cubed or, or something uh, worse. So we, we do have a way to, to make this uh, better, both in communication and in, uh, in computation. Uh, we also have a way to guarantee that uh, everybody agrees initially. So remember we said that if everybody starts out agreeing, then we have sort of almost immediate uh, agreement, uh, uh, confidence. But the coin flip thing doesn't guarantee that, that it takes uh, many layers until, I mean, maybe not many, but it takes several layers at least until we agree. And what we do is we add sort of a, a standard uh, permissionless Byzantine agreement protocol where we, we run that sort of on the side and use that to agree on our initial uh, decision, whether uh, a block is valid or invalid. And so we start out in the good case. And so this works as long as our assumptions hold. And 
only when our assumptions don't hold, then things could get bad, but then we get this convergence from any initial state, so we can go back to the good state. Okay, finally, there are all sorts of ledgers that aren't actual DAGs at all, or, or chains that just use, say, BFT protocols directly, and they get different properties, and I'm completely ignoring them in this talk. Um, but they're out there, and they also have uh, you know, some interesting properties. <laughs>